Thank you. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to introduce you to the Tasmanian Land Conservancy's citizen science program called Wild Tracker. I'm going to touch on how that relates to our other conservation programs, including Land for Wildlife. Um, and then at the end, I'll explain a little bit about our tech behind the platform. Um, and there are a lot of similarities actually with the coral reef project that was on um, spoken about earlier this morning, which is kind of interesting. Um, so Wild Tracker is a digital web platform designed for private landholders to upload, tag and share images that they collect using these motion sensor camera traps, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, camera trapping has really become a hobby for many landowners in Tasmania and around Australia. Um, so there are plenty of farmers who go out with their grandkids and check the cameras when, when they come to visit. Um, there are a lot of people who use these cameras also for security reasons to monitor things like wood hooking on their property. Um, and so we're just providing a platform where they can upload that data that would otherwise be lost. Um, the website was launched in August of last year. Um, we've had a fairly good response so far, but it's very much early days. Um, as much as Wild Tracker has been designed for as a tool to collect data for the TRC. Um, we're trying to design it so that it's a, a great way for landholders to actually manage their own biodiversity data as well. Um, so we're targeting Land for Wildlife members, so the TLC runs that program down in Tassie. Um, we recently took it over from the state government. Um, and we are providing Land for Wildlife members and recently Gardens for Wildlife members with camera packs so they can we lend out these cameras with a little bottle of fish oil as a scent lure, um, stickers and instructions. So when a landowner logs into their account, they see the, um, the boundary of their property and they can drop a pin um, where they've set up the camera. Um, they can give it a unique name that will help them identify where they've set that up. Um, and then they can upload their images to that camera site. Um, so we have this fauna classifier um, with the species on the right uh, and your previews of the image on the left. Um, you can zoom in on the main image and in this example we've got a turbo chook if you're Tasmanian or a Tasmanian native hen if you're not. Um, whoops. And the tag here is Tasmanian native hen. So we're asking um, participants to tag these images with the species that are present. Um, you can also favorite the image and filter them out to find the ones that you're looking for. If you've ever used these camera traps before, you know you're collecting thousands of images and it can become quite overwhelming to actually manage that. Um, and so I think this is a great tool. We also provide some sort of field guide information on the species and how to identify them from specifically camera trap imagery, which is an entirely different ball game to identifying species in real life. Um, and we provide things like um, the key identifying features where they're usually found um, and their names in Palawakani, which is the Tasmanian Aboriginal language. Uh, when a person has gone through and tagged their images, they get just a really uh, brief summary, which is at the moment just a species list. Um, we're thinking of um, expanding on that for basic metrics of biodiversity on the property. Um, and then if you click the little icon next to each species, we provide information on reproductive habits, the habitats they prefer, the history specifically of that species in Tasmania, which is often really interesting. And we also outline some of the threats. So the theory of change is pretty simple. If through Wild Tracker, um, you learn that this is an Eastern Barred Bandicoot, not a big rat, um, you learn that it now lives on your property and through either Wild Tracker itself or the combination with Land for Wildlife and our other programs, you learn what role that animal fills um, in the environment, then we hope you're more likely to take action to support that animal and we're working on actionable advice um, through these programs. So not only you know it's there, but what to do about it. Um, and the really cool thing is we've just been successful in getting a National Environmental Science Program grant that will 
Um, let us measure these things in each of these steps along the way. Um, we've really set ourselves up um, from the beginning um, to be able to do this. So Wild Tracker has become the entry level program for the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. Um, it's now quite um, often the first contact people have with, with us. Um, and then through that program, we are hoping to channel people into Land for Wildlife and Gardens for Wildlife, which are those voluntary conservation programs. And then from this, people sometimes end up um, going the next step and establishing a covenant on their property. So it's images like this one that I think are really special and go a really long way into um, closing that barrier between people and the nature in their backyard. So this is an eastern quoll. Um, can't really see it, but there's a guy sitting in his kitchen. Um, so it's, <laughs> it literally closes the gap. Uh, but of course, apart from the educational and social aspects of this program, there is really good science to be done. So one question in particular I'm interested in looking at is um, comparing wildlife communities across diff different conservation programs. So we're targeting private landholders next to our own private reserves, um, which we already monitor annually with the camera trap grid. Um, we're also targeting conservation covenants that are nearby and properties that are part of our revolving fund, so effectively expanding on our camera network um, to see what different levels of management or how they might impact wildlife communities. Um, from a land for wildlife perspective, I'm really encouraging people to monitor their efforts. So if they're doing weed removal or planting trees, uh, the landowners themselves are able to be there in the long term and can monitor their efforts. Whereas in restoration ecology, the, the money is often gone when it comes to monitoring the impact of things. It's usually put in trees and walk away. So people can fill in that gap. Other questions might be just collecting records of those species that are cryptic and shy. So we have a, eastern, uh, or a little pygmy possum here with the big ears. Um, Tasmania has a massive problem with fallow deer at the moment. So this record came from an Englishman um, who lives on the outskirts of Hobart. Um, and that was his first, he had no idea he had deer in his backyard. Um, and this was his first sort of sighting of a deer pretty shocking to him. Um, also, uh, we have localised extinctions in Tasmania of wombats from Sarcoptic Mange, so that could be something we can pick up on cameras and monitor the spread of. And this is a healthy devil because I didn't want to put a devil facial tumour disease affected devil up on the big screen, um, but that's another thing we can track through cameras. So this is... Um, uh, Becky's house in South Hobart, so it's very much uh, it's maybe like it's basically Hobart. We don't really have suburbs, it's just the one city. But something <laughs> very unique to Tasmania is we still have betongs and bandicoots and potaroos in our backyards. We don't have foxes and we're generally a little bit more envi environmentally aware, main, mostly. Um, and so the cool thing is at this property we have a cat run on the left hand side and then at night time, this is an eastern barred bandicoot running around next to it. Um, so we still have these kinds of opportunities. And uh, from a TLC perspective, we have not traditionally worked with small landholders. So that's where citizen science is leading us into this space. Now this is what I was referring to with similarities with the talk this morning, is we have an AI model that also is pretty good at identifying species from camera trap images. Um, we have this plan and the model is sitting there. We just need funding to smush it into the website um, where the model will automatically remove all those images of grass that um, are really tedious to go through. Um, and it will remove images of people. Um, and then it will we'll ask people to give their best shot for 5% of the photos that they upload identifying them and then that will uh, unlock the AI function where people and the AI will work together for a consensus classification system. We're hoping that that will become accurate enough that uh, this will fill that gap in validation so that we can then upload all these records to national and state biodiversity databases. 
That's really the missing piece at the moment. So when I say AI, it's sort of this amorphous thing that nobody actually knows what it looks like. But it's this place, this, well, it's a bunch of code <laughs> with a bunch of errors at the top initially. <laughs> um, it's just black box stuff. And so we're working with computer scientists on that and it just runs through um, thousands of images um, every sort of couple of minutes. We're expanding that um, specifically on this species, the eastern quoll, which is threatened, um, to play literal spot the difference so the AI um, has the capacity to draw circles around all the dots in the suite on the animals, which are unique, like fingerprints. Um, once we know unique individual animals, we can get estimates of population density and things like that. Um, so I'd like to thank the Elsa Cameron Foundation, the Ian Potter Foundation, and the Paribari Trust. Um, and if we have time, I'll just show some examples. So the, the number I'm giving here, these images are all from a little game we play with um, people and ask them to identify the species in the, in the image. They have 10 seconds. Um, and then I compare it to the AI afterwards and give them the, the answers. So the AI was 93% sure that that was a wombat and it ranks species. So it gives you the second best option and the third best option. 97% sure that that's a spotted tailed quoll, which is pretty good considering it's up a tree, which is not its usual habit. Um, it's not a rock, it's an echidna. That's the most common macropod we have in Tasmania, but the least well identified, which is interesting. Um, so Tasmanian paddy melon or Rufus valley paddy melon. Tassie devil's pretty good with those. These are those turbo chooks, two babies in the adult. And it got all of them. Southern Brown Bandicoot. Here's a cool little video of some of the sort of data that people send in. Another Southern Brown Bandicoot running down the stairs. You can't see that because it's too dark, but it's a possum. Um, Eastern Bard Bandicoot. Long-nosed Potteroo. And we have some comparisons face shape, which seems to be really helping people with that identification. Fallow deer. Another devil, but the ranking on this was quite low because this, this animal doesn't have the white markings on it and the AI doesn't have a sense of size. So everything's the same size to it. So if you imagined that being quite small, it could be a rat, it could be anything. Um, so obviously we need to feed it more images of devils without white markings. There's a quoll down here. Feral cat, not a thylacine. And then just as an example of some of the answers we get, um, this is an eastern beton, um, which is a super cool species. Oops. But the top answers we get are paddy melon, wallaby, then we get to the correct answer. So 80% of people guessing it correct. Then we've got some blanks and question marks. We have my favourite answer here, those things with the little hands that we see, arc. Um, and then we get someone who's old school, but correct, rat kangaroo. Um, so that's some of the kinds of information that we're collecting. And I'll just end there. Thanks, Glenn. Um, we do actually have time for a question for Glenn, because we are not doing too bad, we caught up a bit. Any questions for Glenn about his... Um, Talk. There we go. You have to. It's all philanthropic. It's philanthropic. Um, so yeah, the Elsie Cameron Foundation. My position is funded by the Ian Potter Foundation. We have applied for government grants um, and not been successful. Um, I'm currently in the process. Most of my job at the moment is writing grant applications. Welcome Sorry. to the club. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Oh, Did you all catch it? No, you want to just repeat that a little bit? Yeah. How many of the images that, that we're training the AI on are taken during the day versus the night? It's really, I've never thought of that question. Seems like an obvious one now. 
Um, I would say the majority are actually nighttime ones. Um, there's fewer species out during the day. Um, the AI is trained on one and a half million photos at the moment that have been tagged, but I've just sent off another one and a half million <laughs> to double that. You yeah. sound like uh, Andy with his reef stuff. Yeah. Huge, huge Except number. I feel like his smell of an oily rag is probably quite big to our, compared to our rag. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's a good point. Okay, thanks, Glenn. That was great. Thank you.